Um, hello, hello. Thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I'm a nutritional and environmental physician from Breakspear Medical Group. It's been a, a, a great privilege to, to learn from Dr. Jean Munro and um, today as well to, look, to, to learn from Dr. Bill Ray. Yeah, I'm going to talk about immunotoxicity today. Um, I'm hoping that it will be useful to practitioners, um, particularly practitioners starting out um, in this field, and also useful to the patients that are here as well today. Okay. So, we know we live in a toxic world. I think that's why we're all here uh, today. Um, I hope we realise how significant it is. Um, I don't want to be dramatic about it, but it is a, a quite an urgent state that we're in. Um, one in 5,000 in 1980. Within 30 years, that's one in 64. Okay, autism. That's, that's government statistics. So it's a, it's, a, it's a massive, massive increase almost certainly linked to toxicity. Subfertility, as we heard um, uh, from our eminent guest yesterday, it's on the increase, it's rising. And dementia. I think we all know someone who's had dementia, there's one case diagnosed every seven seconds. The total number's doubled since 1980. Okay, population's not doubled since 1980. So it is a toxic world, okay? I, mean, I say this to motivate us, really, to try and <clears throat> get involved a bit more in these things. So our, aims, um, our aim is to effectively treat our patients, okay? And as uh, Dr. Pilar was talking about yesterday, we hope it's definitive. We hope that we go for the cause, <clears throat> and by getting the cause, we improve the system and the patient. We also want to do this as well, improve the patient relationship with their environment, okay? Two reasons for that. One, you have to reduce toxic load if, if someone with sensitivities is going to get better and the exposure. But also, when someone has that realisation that the way they have been living uh, is not so good and they need to change that, the patients do better, okay? So it's a very important thing. This was actually, both these things were something that Dr. Pilar and, and Raquel um, uh, highlighted to me on my recent visit to, to the foundation. Um, and it's uh, something I hope I'll, ta I'll take forward in my practice as well. So immunotoxicity, um, I think it's a very useful diagnosis to make. I think it has been missed a lot. Um, it's already an established diagnosis, okay? There are thousands of journals about immunotoxicity. There are textbooks about immunotoxicity. There's a, a textbook here, um, uh, Clinical Immunotoxicology, and it's actually written by John Hopkins University and the FDA, okay? So it's an established diagnosis. You don't have to read the whole textbook, but um, it's, uh, it's useful to have it. And it's an environmental diagnosis, okay? It's our, our job to make that diagnosis, okay? Um, it's cause-based. It highlights the to toxicity involved. It explains the infections that are present. It, if, if, it explains the sensitivity state, the autoimmunity state, uh, the general immune dysfunction state and also the general toxic picture that we see. Now for us as doctors it's, uh, and practitioners, it's easy for us to know what the treatment is, okay? It is not always often easy to do the treatment, um, but, but we do know what the treatment is. It's, it's you know, really it is about detoxification, um, but I'll get to that uh, later. For me, it's about the order as well. Each patient is different. Some patients have the infection right at the top, and you need to get rid of that first or control that first. For some people, it's the sensitivities that are right at the top. You have to control that first. So, yeah. So, 
this is just a rough paradigm of where um, immunotoxicity fits in, uh, I think. We have immunotoxicity and neurotoxicity, which I believe Martin Paul was talking about. Endocrine disruptors, which Bill has just t told us about. Enzyme antagonism, um, that often to do with chronic fatigue and things. This is the kind of shared ground, and I think it's quite important for us to clinically think about these things. You have autonomic dysfunction, particularly in fat-soluble toxicity, pesticides and such like. The, the brain stem is open to the toxin. There's no blood-brain barrier there. Um, and uh, you, know, you often see autonomic dysfunction. You often see cardiac toxicity as well. So for us, these are, these are quite key, key features. Okay, there's plenty of journals. I'm sorry I haven't put the actual journal in. I was told to, when there was a mistake on the slides, to blame administration, so I will blame administration about that. Um, but there's plenty of journals here. Chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, uh, cancer, immune dysfunction, chronic disease, early life environment, immune toxicity, uh, the risk of pediatric allergy. Um, biomarkers. Um, this again is a uh, yep. developmental immunotoxicity, uh, autism. <coughs> okay, this one immune alterations associated with exposure to toxic chemicals, and we see the whole shebang really: T cell and B cell deficiency, increased and decreased natural killer cell activity, autoimmune mar markers, ANA, um, so yeah, Ant anti-myelin basic protein antibodies, so yeah, okay. <coughs> apologies, this picture's not come out, okay, it's, uh, apologies about that. So in basic terms, in simplistic terms, what happens, um, the immune system can be down-regulated, Okay, which is causing a, a kind of immunosuppressive picture. It can be upregulated, causing an exaggerated immune response, such as autoimmunity and allergy. The reality is that all of this is normally present. It's just about what, what proportion is there and what's really at the surface. Okay, sorry, that's not come out either. This was showing very nice slides about um, the immune system and how how beautiful and integrated it is, but it, it didn't come out. So, so I'm just going to talk about some, <clears throat> some cases now, okay? Let's try and highlight what we're talking about. <clears throat> this is a 43-year-old uh, lady who attended my clinic, the environmental medicine clinic, with a confirmed diagnosis of sarcoidosis. She'd had a rhinoplasty, and the, the site had developed a, a, a lesion um, and at the same time, her big toe also developed a lesion. She had to be controlled on high doses of steroids. And whenever they dropped the prednisolone down below 10 milligrams, which is a very high dose, she would develop a new lesion. And the last one she developed was in the tear duct. So she wasn't, she wasn't able to drop it below 10 milligrams. She came to me um, asking the question of whether uh, cell wall deficient bacteria could be causing her problem. Okay, it's the power of the internet, and um, it's actually in the medical textbooks that, that, that some of these bugs do cause um, uh, sarcoidosis. And she'd had two chest infections that had lasted five weeks each, and uh, various other. Uh, issues that makes you think that the immune system's not quite working here. Okay, Epstein-Barr virus, tonsillitis, shingles. Okay. <laughs> After the sarcoid, <clears throat> she developed a sensitivity to latex. She developed a delayed hypersensitivity, um, i.e. chemical sensitivity, to furnish her polish, polish and uh, washing up liquid. Okay. She had attempted an anti-inflammatory diet for a previous few months. Um, I think it was good for her. It gave her some control over her illness, and I'm sure it was uh, helping. 
So the environmental history, she moved house in June. It was a 1930s house, um, possibly had lead pipes. Uh, it was renovated as they moved in, and she miscarried as they were renovating the house. Okay. There was a lot of condensation present, um, so probably mould. Uh, it was a mains water supply. And she lived in arable land, so there was, uh, and it wasn't organic land, so there was likely organophosphates and pesticides and such like. And she had two amalgam villains. Okay. So this lady is a quite a good example for us. Um, she's got lead exposure here. The renovation will give her um, wood preservatives, solvents, um, uh, arsenic, again lead, uh, toxicity, mould toxicity, and again organophosphates and the usual filling problem that we see so much of. So the, these were the investigations we did. Really we, we tried to swab any site that we could, could get, get access to really to try and see if there was a bug there or not. Um, and we did a few other antibody tests and such like. We need to say, if these tests all came back negative, my view is that a, a physician that's not thinking would probably just discard it as a case of unknown sarcoid. These tests are at best 80% sensitive. Okay, so you, you know you really need to keep thinking, even if these were negative. Thankfully, they weren't negative. Okay, we were able to do something here. She had styrene. Toxicity. Okay, this is a fat cell pesticide screen. Okay, so we take a little sample of the fat and we analyze it for the fat soluble toxins. So she was styrene toxic. Shouldn't be there at all, there shouldn't be any there, and it was quite high. Um, and as it turned out, that before she became unwell, they had, they had insulated the cavity in the kitchen. So they'd been pumping this styrene uh, into the walls. And actually, where the washing machine was uh, present, the styrene was leaking out for about a month or so. Uh, and this was just a few months before she became unwell. We grew streptococcus pneumonia from her, the, the lesion that she had in her, in her eye site, um, that thankfully was quite sensitive. The GP didn't believe me that it was um, a strep-induced problem, so he ran his own ASOT level, which was elevated as well. So um, here's our routine blood test. Lymphocytes are low. This is immunosuppression, OK? Um, so the, the toxin was styrene. The, the bug was strep. We started her on a detox, and we uh, gave her some azithromycin for the streptococcus. Um, she, our, our steroid dose, I think I've seen her six months ago, her steroid dose has dropped down to about four milligrams, and we're, we're taking it further. Um, I think once she's off her steroids, we'll probably um, give her some immunotherapy, and I think she'll, she'll, she'll do really well. She's quite happy. So this is a, another case. This is um, a slightly rare case, I think. It's less than 5% of cases that, 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 that come to this level and respond so quickly. But I think it, we need to know that it's possible for that to happen. OK. You, sorry. He was a five-year-old. Regressive autism, as most of them are, 18 months, they basically lost him. Um, he stopped speaking, very poor attention, uh, very agitated. Uh, and there was some signs of inflammatory bowel, leaning over chairs and, and crying at night and things. On examination, he was very pale, he was distant, his eyes were glazed. Um, he looked encephalopathic. He was stimming, he had abdominal tenderness and his bowel sounds were diminished, probably an autonomic feature. Um, tonsils were also enlarged. And he had posterior lymphadenopathy, sorry. He had posterior lymphadenopathy, which is something you really need to be thinking about uh, with the herpes viruses. So we just did some uh, basic tests. He went on to a gluten-free, casein-free diet, routine blood test, and MMR antibodies. <clears throat> Now, this was done for, to try and assess his immune function, okay? Often what you get is when part of the immune system has been, been poisoned, 
Um, it doesn't work very well. And the body compensates by producing more antibodies to try and fight the infections. Okay. So that is the case here. The normal should be over 200. You're really thinking about 400 or 500 would be an adequate response. His was 1,500. Okay. Again, this nine times the upper limit here. Okay. Doesn't diagnose infection. Certainly does diagnose immune dysfunction. So, yep. This was his blood test. Again, look at the immune dysfunction. Lymphocytes are low, monocytes are low. This is about 40%, 30 to 40% of autistic kids will have this. Okay. And about 99% will have a low uric acid. Okay. So was there a viral infection? Parents didn't have a lot of money, um, so we went straight for uh, an antiviral, uh, the purpose being to try and wake, wake the kid up as quickly as possible so he can finish his development. <clears throat> and we started him in Immunivir. Within four weeks, he was a completely different child. I mean, he really was just com completely different. Um, huge improvement. Um, yeah. We kept him with immunivir for four weeks, and after four weeks, we discharged him to the nutritionist who is uh, just looking for the toxin and will detox him over the next few years. Um, but he's, he's doing really well, okay? I would encourage everyone to be involved with treating autism, okay? It is a very satisfying work for us to do, to see these kids recover, to see the parents um, um, distress, relieved. Um, <coughs> And uh, really, it's really, it's really needed. Um, there's not a lot of people treating it. It is very treatable uh, about, in about 80% of cases. So um, I'd encourage people to get involved in it. And it is an environmental illness, without a doubt. This is another case, OK? This is just, uh, I put this case in just to emphasize the difference in presentation and that we should treat each person differently. He was also diagnosed with autism. Um, and, uh, but he was, he was more of a fatigue person. He came in very sluggish, and he kind of slumped down in front of the toys, and, um, you know, poor concentration, and just very, very sluggish. Okay, he had a hyperdynamic precordium. There was an energy debt, or uh, he couldn't do more than 10 squats, okay? A child of six should be able to do 100 squats. Um, okay. I thought it was a mitochondrial problem, um, and I sent him to Dr. Julu to do a chronic fatigue assessment uh, uh, on autonomic profile. Um, and we did some other tests as well. Now, this was the autonomic profile. This, for me, is, is, a, is, a, uh, is a benchmark, is a new level, a platform in, um, in, in medicine, really. It's a new level of diagnostic testing. Um, anyone that wants to learn this, anyone that wants to be involved in this and see more of it, you're more than happy to come to the clinic um, and, and we can train your technician up to do this. Um, it's absolutely been invaluable to us at Breakspear. Now, if you look here, his oxygen was 3.5. This is his tissue oxygenation, not his blood oxygenation, tissue. It should be over 60, okay? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a good look. It's very, very low. Oh, and it corrected with oxygen. Dr. Julie gave him some oxygen, and this started to pick up. So we sent this kid home on uh, oxygen, four litres a minute, uh, four hours a day for four weeks, and some mitochondrial support. Uh, even though Dr. Julie disagreed with my diagnosis, that's okay. We don't mind if he disagrees. It's fine. Um, he thought it was more of vascular endothelial dysfunction which can be caused by mitochondrial disorder, but, you know, we're not getting to that. <laughs> um, it, but, we, yeah, he corrected. After four weeks of oxygen, four weeks of um, nutritional support, completely different child again. He was, he was on the, he was on the, um, he was riding his bike for two hours a day. And interestingly, the father came in to his next consult. He wasn't there at the first one, just to find out what we were doing, because the, the change was so significant. It's very satisfying to work in this kind of field. Um, yep. Uh, da, 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 da. And this was his repeat measurement. Now, he was off oxygen for four months at this point. 
okay? It's corrected itself, okay? It's reset itself, uh, so which is very good. Um, yeah. And these are some of the, let me go back and just show you some of the, how much time have I got? Have I got? 10 minutes. So just, we'll just discuss this uh, autonomic profile a little bit. This thing here, okay, a low parasympathetic tone. It's a very common finding. Um, over 80% of autistic children have it, but over 80% of um, uh, our uh, chemical patients have this as well. They often have it because of an increased sympathetic response, as Dr. Ray was uh, talking about, um, that they're fighting and fighting all the time, and they're fighting something that's in their body, normally a toxin, and that's what we have to get out. And when you, as you remove it, the, sympathetic, the parasympathetic tone just increases, and the sympathetic drive comes down. And we've seen about 500 patients um, with this. Okay. This one is very interesting. This is inotropic fatigue. This is reduced contractility of the heart. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very clever measure. All of chronic fatigue patients that we've measured, almost all, about 99%, have had this low contractility. Okay. So we're, we're, we're going to publish on this very soon. Okay, that's that, that, that. So that was that, yep. <clears throat> this is the test that Dr. Monroe was talking about yesterday. Um, this is a lymphocyte sensitivity test. I would encourage all practitioners to get involved with Acumen, okay? You can send them samples by courier. It's a, he's a very clever, clever biochemist that is really doing lots of good for us. It basically exposes a, a cell to a toxin and sees how much calcium moves into the cell. Okay, value here was 85, which was normal. Value here for nickel was 310. Okay, so in the presence of nickel, calcium will flux into the cell very quickly and will cause the cell to be disrupted and if the immune function and all other function to be disrupted. So a very useful test. If you are toxic with nickel as well, um, you're always going to have this, okay? There's always going to be calcium in your cell, okay? He was also sensitive to detergents, okay? Perborates, 370. So we cleaned his environment up. This was his, this is another test. These are basically just to look for the toxin because they're quite difficult to find. And um, it shows that there's a nickel complex here. And that nickel has been such a problem for such a long time that the nickel is actually bound to the proteins in the cell, um, which is quite, quite tricky to, to remove. He's got a bit of mercury. He's, he was born in 2005, so he will have mercury. Um, kids that are born after 2007 in the UK, um, they don't have much mercury but they have a lot of aluminium, which took mercury's place in vaccinations. So he also had this as well, and he, had, he was anaerobic, okay? Now, you would think we detoxed this kid a lot. You would think we went in with loads of things and chelation and everything. We just gave him oxygen and mitochondrial support. And it was the fact he didn't have any oxygen why he, didn't, um, he wasn't able to detox. So it was just, it was a very simple thing, and he just detoxed very well without chelation. I want to say a point, uh, particularly for the patients here. Um, uh, you know, sometimes patients do get worse when you're treating, okay? Our job is to make sure that clinically you're safe, okay? But you may feel a lot worse, okay? Um, it is far better to go through that route than to have no change at all, okay? No change is a bit more worrying than, 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 than a change. This kid, again, immunosuppressed, a bit inflammatory. Um, this was just after the oxygen and the treatment. He'd, he'd, inflammation had dropped, and he, things had got a bit better. Interestingly, this result. So his immune system is clearly a bit better, okay? He's actually mounting a response here to something. ESR is massive. For a child of six, 34 is a huge ESR. 
he was absolutely brilliant at this point. He was bouncing off the wall. He was, he was very, very happy um, uh, child, and the parents were very happy. All that had happened here is his immune system had kicked in and started to fight. And that's why he mounted an inflammatory response there. And this is what we see. His strep antibody was 400. His anti-DNAs was 1,200. OK? This kid has a severe strep issue, and that's what he was fighting when, he, um, uh, when the inflammation went up. OK? So that's what. This is something that we are looking a bit more into. I believe that Dr. Munro is uh, going to speak about this hopefully tomorrow. And it is very, very, it's a very important uh, field for us um, about tissue uh, gases and such like. OK. The school phoned me and said, well done, thank you. OK, so I'm just, I'm just trying to encourage people to, to get involved in this kind of treatment. <clears throat> My golden rule, teach it, treat everyone differently. Both those parent, patients were completely different. One needed oxygen, one needed an antiviral. They both had the same diagnosis. And even with immunotoxicity, they'd still both have the same diagnosis. So please try and treat uh, these people differently. <clears throat> I'm going to briefly talk about our usual steps. Uh, firstly, for the children. Secondly, for the adults. Okay. With the kids, the goal is wake them up quickly. Okay. They've got a developmental period. They don't have often the time it takes to detox, which can be a year or two. You want to wake them up as quickly as you can. Okay. And in half of those kids, it will involve treating an infection. Okay. Always look for the gut first. That's what we do. We always treat the gut first. That's diet. That's um, if there's any bugs there or any yeast there. Um, correct the deficiencies. Okay. Start the system working properly again. Then go to treating the infections. Okay. As you're treating these infections, you start the detox process. As I say, this is just for half the cases, okay, and only about half of them will make it through there because most of them will end up going off on a different route, okay? But it's just a useful principle, okay? And then you boost the function, GPC, oils, uh, et cetera, okay? <clears throat> Sorry, that's, um, that's my um, inadequate computer skills there. Sorry about that. So this is adults, okay? This is a, the, the, a rough approach to an immuno, immunotoxic a, adult. You treat the gut, okay? If they don't have um, a high acid, okay, in the stomach, which you can easily test by giving them bicarb, if you give them a teaspoon of bicarb and they don't belch, then it's, it's unlikely they're going to have acid, excess acid there. I start them on this gut support program, okay? This group of supplements here, okay, glutamine, vitamin D, vitamin A, and probably coconut oil as well. This is for the hypermobility patient. This is for the leaky gut, okay? And <clears throat> you'll find about 40% of patients that we see in the environmental clinics will have hypermobility and therefore will have increased intestinal permeability, leaky gut. So these are very useful supplements if you can tolerate them. Acidify the meals, okay, then alkalize the, the, the duodenum two hours after, digestive enzymes, very useful probiotics if they'll tolerate them. This very, very important, organic and whole food, clean water and clean house. That's the start, okay. If a patient can't do these things or are unwilling to do these things, <clears throat> I think it's unlikely they're going to get any better, okay. These three things at the bottom here, okay. Is that okay? Move on. <clears throat> okay, then attempt some stabilization, okay, different than the kids. The kids you want to wake up, the, the adults that have already been through the development, you want to stabilize them, correct their deficiencies, <clears throat> and then low dose immunotherapy. Okay, <clears throat> if it's severe, uh, which most of the patients that we'll see uh, are, you need to do an extensive program, okay? Common foods and just basically what they're exposed to in their environment, you need to give them some protection for. Very important to learn how to manage your acute reactions, okay? You need to carry some of the vaccine around. You need to know about tri salts and vitamin C, okay? It's very, very important to do that. 
Also, if, the mo if they're moderately affected, you want to cover what you're going to provoke them with and they're what you think they're sensitive to. And if there's mild sensitivity, it's a cost issue, OK? I mean, if they could afford it, you would probably do a bit more. But uh, if, if, if it's just mild, you would probably just do as required, OK? This is the big thing, OK? Jean is uh, generously going to talk about it for us pre-publication. It's really, really significant. Um, you need to learn how to breathe when you're being provoked, OK? There's a very known syndrome called allergy and hyperventilation syndrome to do with the bronchi. Um, uh, and if you can do this breathing, it can be very, very helpful, OK? I think, are you talking about it tomorrow? Yeah, we're talking about it tomorrow, OK? And if you need any instructions and such like, just contact us. We'll send you, the, send you our, our, what we know so far, OK? But this is the big one, OK? All the patients in the back are cringing. They know it's about detox, OK? You, you, this is the big one, which you have to try and get the patient through, OK? Just a few points to consider when you're detoxing. You may feel worse. Patients may feel worse, OK? You need to warn them about that. They need to be prepared about that, and you need to know how to manage that, OK? Um, uh, immune reactivation, OK? It's a great sign. When a patient comes to you and says, I've got a fever, OK? I've got a fever. It's brilliant. You know, it's very good news. It means their immune system's kicked back in. You do have to go looking for infections at that point. But um, it's a really good sign if you start getting fevers and such like. Bio binders, OK? We use cholestyramine. It's a prescription drug, so it has to be from a doctor. And charcoal, OK? This just binds the toxin in the, from the gallbladder and prevents the, the, the recirculation of the toxin. Really, it's one of the first things you want to try and put in, if you can, OK, if they can tolerate it. And as I say, remember the trisulfs, vitamin C, and your vaccines, your immunotherapy. This will get you through the detox a lot of the time, OK? And this is like a basic thing. Take your good fats, OK? Eat your fish oils, uh, GPC, which is phosphatidylcholine. Um, uh, do your saunas, do your binders. Make sure you've got some antioxidant cover. This is, you know, detox is difficult because people have problems with it, OK? OK. Um, uh, so, so you do need to do it with support, OK? Um, and, you know, if a practitioner's here, a nutritionist or, or such like, that needs support from us, we're happy to talk over the phone and things. Um, uh, uh, as, as you know, we've got Dr Ray and Dr Monroe. We need to use those resources as much as we can. Um, they've, they've, they've done it, OK? If you think about it, they've done it. So, um, you know, we do need to use that. I think that's me, is it? Sorry, just quickly treating infections. This is some of the things that we use. OK, Coriolis mushrooms. Watch this space for that. I think there'll be a lot more studies about that. OK, and these other things. Is that it? That's it. OK, thank you. Okay.